God of healing, when someone in your world suffers, you suffer as well. Restore your world and heal your children so that no one needs to suffer any longer. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. For those of us gathered, take a moment to welcome the people around you with a greeting. For those of you online, please share a word of peace in the comment or chat. Most of all, as you go out into the world, may we great greet others as people of peace. The first reading is from James chapter 5. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> the prayer of faith will, will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. Anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it did not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, <clears throat> and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel from Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue came, named Jairus, and when he saw him, Jairus fell at Jesus' feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? Jesus looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling. She fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a, com a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then Jesus put them all outside and took the father, child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. 
Grace and peace to you from God and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Welcome. So good to have you this morning as we continue our walk through the Gospel of Mark. There's no catching up to do because last week we ended uh, where we began today. And um, Mark's a short book to read. You can read it in just a couple of hours fully. And so that is our New Year's resolution here at St. Luke's is reading through the entire Gospel of Mark. You're up through chapter 5. Um, if you've been attending every Sunday, and I try to catch you up in between. Today, um, I bring with me the prayer requests from our e-news. And somebody asked me, Rob, it's so long, why don't you take some of those off? We do, but we ask the person first. We try to connect with them and find out if they need more healing if they need more prayer. And in fact, this morning when I walked in, I saw one of our members who has a person on the prayer list, and I asked, and um, that person had been in the hospital home. I said, should we take the person off the list? And she said, no, please keep praying for him. And so we will continue. I'd rather pray too long than not pray enough. And I love that this community really holds to prayer. I forgot to share this at the first um, worship. I'm grateful that we have people that are committed to being and receive urgent prayer requests that we send out uh, when somebody's in drastic need. There's about a half dozen people who said, call anytime. Send a text. I will pray. And we have our prayer link on our website that we uh, people can submit to all out 24-7. You know, I love our care team, which is going to be meeting tomorrow at 11, and they go and uh, meet members of our community that are unable to attend worship, and um, they bring them communion, and they pray with them, and they, they stay in contact with them. I am thankful for our council. We start all of our council meetings with a devotion, and then we pray through the prayer list of those new prayers that have come in the past month. And we still get done within two hours. My wife, who's on another council at her church, is always mad at me. Because we do that and a learning time. And we get out in about an hour and a half. And she's sitting in her council meeting, not doing any of those things, for three hours. So I text her when I'm done. And she, she wrote back, grr. <laughs> I love that um, we have prayer. Uh, through our emails and texts. Um, and often I hear when I connect with somebody, I'm like, oh, you called at the perfect time. But know that I don't always do that. So sometimes the pastor is the last one to know. And if you would like me to know, um, that takes some time. You'll hear that in my message a little bit later. And then for confirmation, we end every gathering in prayer. And... Um, it's, it's beautiful. There's times when we're, we have our confirmation class, and I say we have just enough time to do either a game or pray. Almost always. Don is here. She can, she can uh, attest to this, that they say, let's pray. And so we gather around, and we have our prayer time. We invite them to pray for something that's happening in their life. Often it's homework, but it's also the parents and grandparents, their neighbors, their friends. Uh, and then something in the world. And so Ukraine comes up and what's happening in the Holy Lands and uh, people who are homeless, people who are in need of food. It's a beautiful thing. Last Wednesday, we took a field trip. We went to Luther Seminary and learned about vocation there. And um, there were all these different spaces that we could go to, a prayer time and um, a service project and remembering our baptism and going to the library uh, because you can go to Luther Seminary and become a professor of theology and went up top and one of the things that they saw was Luther's death mask. I guess there's five in the world, I was told. That's one of five. Um, almost all the kids were a little freaked out by that. Um, but uh, very good. And I say all of this because prayer and scripture are two of the things that keep us grounded. Pastor Steve Olson, I said this last worship, and I say it again, recognize that 1% of your day is about 14 minutes. 
you can read through the entire prayer list in less than seven minutes. And you can read this assigned scripture for going through the Gospel of Mark in less than seven minutes. Giving that time over to God and be grounded in your faith. Luke Timothy Johnson, in his commentary on our first reading in James, wrote this. Prayer of the community that gathers in solidarity to support its sick and by confessing sins one to another also strengthens its spiritual weakness which is already a victory over the world which defines itself by envy and competition. There is no envy or competition found in our gospel reading today. In fact, there's solidarity, support, a confession that brings healing and strength and a glimpse of the ultimate healing. Femi Perkins commented on the Mark passage in these two healing stories, recognizing that one interrupts another. The religious leader asks Jesus to come and heal his daughter, and while he's on his way home, a woman distracts Jesus with her own prayer request. Note that Mark names the religious leader, Jairus, and his position, that he's ruler of the synagogue, which means he is quite wealthy and influential at that time. And the woman remains nameless, a member of the crowd who has been suffering for 12 years. She's endured many physicians and had spent all she had. And this shows that Jesus treats everyone equally, from the greatest to the least of these. And it's the least of these who interrupts the healing of the greatest of these. During this time in history, the woman who approaches Jesus is not only physically suffering, but as we heard, she spent all of her money trying to find healing. Thankfully, we don't have to do that in our society anymore. And um, socially, she has been kept away from community. Anyone who would come into contact with her, as you read in Leviticus 15, 19 through 33, would make them impure. And so she had to overcome her social and ritual boundaries to approach and touch Jesus. Struggling through the crowd, her ability to overcome obstacles that separate her from community with anyone. And Jesus healed her without instructing her to observe the required period of purification. Blood on someone was a sign that they probably had a demon within them or something, and they had to stay away so no one else would be, catch it. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't send her back to the priest like we heard he did with the leper. No, what Jesus does instead, he refers to her as daughter. She is now in relationship with Jesus as family. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the early church, we would help, the church would help one another. So she was taken care of socially and financially. Her needs were going to be cared for. She was back fully in community and wholeness. I know a lot of people who have purity and piety issues still today. But what they perceive is illnesses. But when that illness is present within a family member, it's difficult to stay distant. A friend of our family has a child. Um, this friend, she was very homophobic. She was at all the rallies condemning anyone who um, was gay. And then her son came out to her and said, Mom, that's me. And she was broken. And she had to come to this understanding. Does she give up her son? Or does she welcome him? Now she's one of the biggest advocates for people who um, are gay and speaks to other parents about the process she had to go through to find healing. Ritual purity and piety are dismissed when it comes home. That's what I see happening in our scripture today. The woman 
had been abandoned because of ritual purity and piety. And Jesus says, nope, welcome to the family. Come on in. These two healing stories, we need to also recognize how the healing took place. First and foremost, what had to happen? They had to make it known. They had to take action for the healing. Jairus, the religious leader, remember, the religious leaders didn't like Jesus at this time. He came, fell to Jesus' knees and begged him to heal his daughter. And then you have the woman who sneaks up behind Jesus, forgetting about all the ritual purity and piety laws, to touch him to receive healing. And then Jesus points out that it's not him who healed her. It was her faith that made her well. And when Jesus does arrive at the home where the daughter is eventually, with his associates and friends, the people there continue to provide some obstacles, including laughing at his claim that the girl is not dead. In fact, the ritual rites are happening right now. That's why they're outside weeping and wailing. They were preparing for the funeral. And then the daughter is told by Jesus to rise up. And the word that he uses is the same word for resurrection. Working preacher asked, can Jesus, who had already shown to have authority over nature, demons, and diseases, overcome this death too? The letter writer of James makes no difference between being raised up out of bed and being raised up in resurrection. These healings are not mutually exclusive. This is one of the pieces of the story that we fail to recognize when reading healing stories in the Bible, is where is Jairus and where is this woman now? Jesus healed them, but they still died. Death is inevitable. This point in life is to learn how to live as people of God and to care for and give glimpses of heaven on earth as we support and heal one another, becoming that family, calling one who's on the outside a sibling of ours. And that is why we have on our funeral bulletins, we announce the celebration of life and resurrection. We celebrate the life that the person had here on earth, and we celebrate the new life that we know that they have in heaven. We are trusting in the promise that the person is fully healed and has life eternal with the Creator. And we get a glimpse of what that looks like next week in our gospel reading. Back to prayer and the commentary on James. Does the church, like the world, seek its own survival by defending itself against the threat of weakness? Or does the church seek friendship with God by embracing in the same spirit of open gift-giving to all of God's creatures so that the strength of each one is gathered from the shared strength of all? I believe the faithful, like both the woman and the religious leader, know that healing for one is healing for all. There is no outburst from the religious leader when he is told that his daughter has died. Couldn't you just see that? Here he's walking with Jesus, and this woman comes in, interrupts him, stops the whole procession, and then is told that his daughter died, and I think I'd be mad. You said you were going to come to my daughter's house, and now you've been waylaid by this woman, and my daughter is dead. But the leader paused enough To hear Jesus say, she is not dead, she is only sleeping. In this, I find great comfort, solace, strength, and hope. When my parents died, there I was consoling my wife Nancy. And as she's crying on my shoulder, she looks up at me and goes, wait, it's your parents who died. Why are you consoling me? Because I know the promise. I'm sad. I was shocked. But I know that they are healed. And that they are in heaven. And they are always with me. And one day we will all be together again. I trust in that promise. We can get so caught up in the world that we create chaos. 
We live in envy and competition and selfishness. And I pray for our nation as we move ahead in this election year that those things can be absolved and we see each other as brothers and sisters, that we speak kindly of one another in spite of our differences, that we can enjoy a table together. We get so caught up in this world, we need to remember what happens, happens. Rest in peace is not for death. It's for living in this lifetime, finding the peace that surpasses all understanding. In the end, Jesus speaks of the reality of life. I love that last phrase. Give her something to eat. She's hungry. We need that nourishment, don't we? Think of how Jesus responds in all these difficult times. In the night in which he was betrayed, what did he do? He served a meal before his death. And after he was resurrected and prior to being ascended, what did he do? After the miraculous catch of fish, he told his disciples to come to the shore. He already had fish and bread on the fire for them. God knows what we need and that we need to be nourished. And one of the greatest things that nourish us is reading scripture and sharing in prayer. And so that is what I would like to close with today. To lift up the names of the people that others have asked us to pray for. Let us pray. Lord, we hold our family members and friends and neighbors in prayer. For Dan and for Tori, for Tim and Betty, Frank and Jake, Peter and Pamela, Scott, Jerry, Mary Jean, Britt, Nancy, Carol, Tom, Carol, Maria, Carolyn, Matt, Gerald, Michelle, Bonnie, Rich, Barb, Nick, Angie, for the Holy Land, for those who have lost loved ones, for Kim and for Evan, for my father, for my mother, for Randy, for Phyllis, for Renee, for my daughter, for my son, for my friend, for Linda, for Kaisen, for Mary, for Kelly, for Mary, for Andrew, for my nephew, my niece, for my personal physical issues, for my financial issues, for, for peace, for my mother, for my neighbors, for Peggy and Tom, for Jackie, and for all those that we have on our hearts that we lift up to Lord, lift up to the Lord. May these be prayers of thanksgiving as we support and care for one another in our congregation, for our families and our friends and our neighbors. For this place, St. Luke's, which speaks a word of hope and promise that all may, that all the things that we do, large and small, Make the world a more loving and beautiful place, giving a glimpse of heaven on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us pray together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With reverence for the earth, those in need, and the whole human family, let us offer our prayers to God. Revive your people to proclaim your mercies that are new every morning. Hear us, O oh God. Raise up world leaders who reflect the generous favor you bestow on all nations and peoples. Hear us, O oh God. Renew your creation, especially endangered species and land, air, or water polluted by human neglect and waste. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is Restore to health all those living with disease, chronic illness, grief, loss, or a broken heart. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is Deepen the genuine love of this community and send us forth filled with your generosity and peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gather us with the communion of saints whom you have lifted from death to eternal life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive our hopes and prayers, O oh God of mercy, for great is your faithfulness in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen come to this table of acceptance, forgiveness, and love, knowing that we have failed. We have failed in our relationships. We have failed in doing the things that we should not do and not doing the things we should do. But we are in good company. That was the disciples who were gathered at the table. Jesus knew that they would betray, desert, and deny him. But Jesus loves all in spite of our failings and calls us to love one another, to find reconciliation and healing in body, mind, and soul. I encourage us to take a moment of silent reflection, confessing to God. What did Jesus do? He offered himself. His act of sacrifice so that we might live. Of giving himself so that we have, would have strength. So that we too might live and help others to do so in his name. And so he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, gave it to all the drinks, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we share the body and blood of our Lord and Savior who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. I invite those who are assisting to please come forward at this time. For those of you who are at home, take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you who are gathered, you will be invited up to uh, kneel or stand at the altar rail. You'll be offered a wafer. Um, you can request the gluten-free wafer, and you'll be offered um, wine and grape juice. The wine is in the lighter um, glasses, and the wine is in the darker glasses, and the grape juice is in the lighter glasses. Know that this is the Lord's table. All are welcome to come and receive this gift. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, that you have fed us at your banqueting table with bread and wine beyond compare. The very life of Christ for us. Send your spirit with us now that we may set the captive free, use our gifts to build one another up, and in everything reflect your glory revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
in peace and serve the Lord.